Father, we just thank you for your house. We thank you for the freedom that the Holy Spirit brings to us, God, that in this place there would be liberty, absolute liberty in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. We're asking you, God, that you would be here with us, God, that we would revel in your presence this morning as you train us and teach us and establish or sow a seed of life into our lives in Jesus' name. I thank you that in this place, in this environment, it is a place of restoration. It is a place of healing. I thank you that your word sets us free. And God, I thank you that in this house you are making, you are raising up disciples that are fruitful, that are filled with purpose, filled with purpose and released into purpose in Jesus' name. So right now, I ask you, God, for your anointing. Anoint me to communicate what is on the heart of God and anoint us to receive what the Spirit of God is saying to us this morning. We, we open ourselves up to all that you have in mind in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that as I'm submitted unto you, I can resist the enemy and he must flee in Jesus' name. Won't you come and have your way in this church this morning? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand up and... Uh, Give somebody a hug. I know that you think that's a bad thing, but watch, we're going to battle to end it. Um. Mm. I told you. Some of you are thinking, I wish I sat in a different seat this morning. But anyway, this is church. It's called Christianity. Stretch yourself. <clears throat> uh, we, we were obviously in a conference for three days this week. And uh, it was more of a conference to, to share what's happening in the world, some of the troubles in the world, and some of the victories that God is bringing about through the people of God in the world. And a lot of it was very inspiring. On Thursday morning, we sat, uh, or we sat in the session, and Tim Keller preached just for, I think, 20 minutes. But one of the things he said was, was very interesting to me, and it just reminded, uh, I was reminded of it, of it this morning, is that we're, for the first time, the church is in a, a post-Christian culture. That means there was a time when Christianity was generally accepted. You know, everybody, even if I'm not so serving God, it's probably where I come from, and there's not much resistance to it. But right now, we're in a post-Christian culture, which means that acceptance, we have passed it, and now we're actually rejected as Christians. We're probably, as the church, probably receiving the most rejection or resistance ever before in history. It's quite a scary thought. And uh, another truth that he, uh, that he added to that is that the most secularized um, grouping in society is the Western church, so in the church rather, is the Western church. And, and the most secularized in that group is probably white Christians. And the most secularized within the white Christian group is the white male, is that he is becoming more and more secularized. That means more and more adept to the things of the world than to the things of God while he's serving God. And in fact, he's dying off, which means not white males, but white Christian males. The true expression of serving God is becoming something slowly of the past within the church through Christian men. I know that some of you, I don't know if you're offended, you shouldn't be. Um, but it just draws some reality and a bit of a, a check in our own lives. Where am I at with God? You know, the thing about being secularized is that I start to look like the world, everybody else. When I go to work, nobody notices me. <laughs> Where, because I have the Spirit of God and I should be noticed, my influence should be, people should be aware of my influence because I am a believer. But what happens when we become increasingly secularized is that we're, we blend in and nobody notices that I have something in me that's greater than the, he that is in the world. Amen. So I don't want to, so this is not a heavy word, it's actually going to be quite fun. But I just want us to start in the right place with a little bit of introspection into our own lives. I want to read you a passage of scripture in Judges from verse 1. It's 11 verses, so bear with me, work very hard, and it's not going to go on the screen. But 
there's some fruits to, you know, no, nobody owns up to, yeah, that's me, I'm secular. No, nobody in church this morning is going to say, you're speaking my language. But sometimes we need to identify the fruit to recognize where I'm actually at. And uh, anyway, again, this is not a judgment, but rather just to get us into the right place. The title of my word this morning is Travel Light. I bet you that person was wishing they heard the word before they left home. But uh, Travel Light, it says this, 11 verses, Judges 6. Everybody here today? Good. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and Amalekites and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops and all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. Midian so, impro- uh, sorry. Midian so impoverished, impoverished the Israelites that they cried out in the, to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Uh, slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all the, uh, your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I've done all this for you. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. And so often we are more aware of our circumstances than why we are stuck or ravaged by those same circumstances. That God has been so good to us through Jesus and yet in Jesus we still have situations We're still hearing words of blessing, but wondering where is the blessing? And so often it's actually God, not God, church, the answer's within me, is where am I at? How's it going with me? How invested am I in Him? I'm praying for investment from heaven in me, but how invested am I in Him? And is it because of where I'm at in God that I'm actually open to the circumstances of the world? Does that make sense? It says in Hebrews, Uh, 12, verse 1, I want to read it so I don't ruin it, so be patient. So since we are surrounded by, I'm going to just say the first few words slowly. Um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let's just say that again. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, say throw off, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, when something so easily entangles, it's like I I didn't realize it was happening, but suddenly my movement became restricted and I looked down and I realized I'm entangled. (laughs) And even the word entangled means I'm not easily going to get out of this situation. It's going to take time for me to get back to where I should be. So the encouragement from the writer is throw off the things that hinder you. Make sure that you know them. We will never know what's holding me back until I actually recognize them. Amen. Until I'm looking for the things that are holding me back in God. Amen. Amen. So the title of the message, as I've said, is Travel Light. Obviously, we've just been to New York uh, Cheryl Watson's not here, so I'll just talk about her for a few moments. Uh, so Cheryl Watson had this this hand luggage that weighed probably more than her her her, carry, her bag that went onto the cargo hold. It was heavy. I know it was heavy because we shared it. We all had to try and carry that bag because it was too heavy for a, a lady to carry. But you know, traveling heavy makes the trip a whole lot harder, doesn't it? And there's this passage of scripture that I want to speak out of. It's Luke 10 and Jesus sending out the disciples. But he gives clear instruction on how to travel. If you're going to go in my name, there's, a, there's only one way you can go. As often we think we know there's many ways or I'm going to go like this because this is my personality and I've always just had these things attached to my life. No, if you go heavy, you're not going to go far. 
And so God teaches us how to travel. But it's very exciting to get some information on how to do it. I went camping recently. It was the Mighty Men's Camp. And, uh, you know, my, my, I've probably let my children, my boys, down a few times. I know I expose myself as, this, as a father fairly re- uh, regularly from here. But I'll just keep going because it works for me. Um, Reuben and I have had this tussle about the fathers, dads, and lads camp for a couple of years. I've taken him once, which is probably the first mistake I made, because once I took him once, every year he wanted to go back, which I don't have a problem with, but being busy on Sundays and weekends and, and just the business of life, busyness of life, it hasn't been easy. And so my guilt in this area has increased over the years. It's only been a couple of years. So I was preaching at the Mighty Men's Camp. Now, ordinarily, I would say, I'm not taking anybody with me because I need a focus. I was preaching three sessions, and uh, I didn't really know where I was going to go in those sessions, but I did have this thing in my heart. If I take my boys, I'm kind of going to kill two birds with one stone. I can take them camping, and I can preach, and I'm going to just at least release some, some guilt. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm a little bit more mature, probably hopefully a little bit more able to do this. I'm going to take my boys. Now, the problem is, it's not the camping. It's, it's every, anybody knows, the problem is not going camping. It's having everything you need to go camping. As camping is not cheap. So in, in preparation for camping, about two years ago, I brought, I bought, we bought Ruben a, a tent for his birthday. It cost a lot of money. And two years later, we used it for the first time. But the fact that we only had a tent didn't really get us very far. Because there's a whole lot of other things you need. So we went and took my bucky. My bucky was packed to the max. In fact, a little tawny cover that covers the bin didn't, couldn't close properly. So when we got there, we were full of dust. And the back was packed with... Suddenly, you know, my children never read on their own. They, they'll read with you and they like that. But, but suddenly they were readers. So they both took their own bag and they had every book they owned in the car. And uh, so we got to the camp and we parked, but I was preaching in a few, about probably half an hour after we arrived on the Saturday morning, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare or even go to our camp, so I just parked the, the car at the back of the, the field where, um, where the preacher, the stage was, and suddenly the realities of having my boys with me kicked in, thinking, who's going to look after them while I'm preaching? And then I thought, okay, just hang around the car. But now while I'm on stage preaching, I can see them in the car, but... <laughs> We have, I have this little back window on the back, the back vase. It, it's, it's an opening and closing window. So they don't, not using, they're not using the doors. They're using the little window to get out of the car. They could use the doors, but they thought the window is probably a better option for them. Seems we're camping. So I can see them. I'm preaching, but I can see them in my car, and they're going in and out. And I know a few things about there's going to be things that are getting scratched and scraped and dirtied getting into that window. So the fingerprints and the evidence is all there even today. But... I get to the car and all the books are everywhere. Everything they bought to the, brought to the camp was open in the car. And we hadn't even got to the campsite. So we got to the campsite eventually a few hours later. And I'm, I'm keeping calm because we're at a camp and this is probably reasonable. So I get to the campsite and it's, 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 it's great. And there's a little hut. Now we brought our tent, but I can see the hut probably means we don't have to set up the tent. So I'm hoping that maybe the boys would rather go in the hut. So we get to the camp and, and uh, they're playing around. Now, one thing you must know about my sons, I'm just going to talk in plurals not to uncover either one of them. <laughs> but <clears throat> one thing you must know about my sons is they only tell you they need the toilet. In fact, they only accept they need the toilet when it's happening. <laughs> so, so there's no pre like. I'm probably going to need the toilet in a few minutes. I should probably be close to a toilet right now, given the time frames. Uh, there's none of that. There's, Dad, I need the toilet right now. So at our particular campsite, because I requested somewhere secluded where I could pray and seek the Lord, there was no toilet within 100 meters. So this particular son was doing his dance. And I even, so he does this like he just he starts to move. And it's rhythmic, but it's not, it's not attractive. And uh, he's moving around, and I'm hoping, do you need a wee? Like, that's a positive question. Do you need a wee? Smile on my face, encouraging you. No, 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 I don't need a wee. Okay, run. 
So I said, there's the toilet. There's like a little hut. And it's open. It's a walled hut, but it doesn't have, you can see below, so you can see the feet. And you can see the head if you're tall enough. And I, like, he's running, and I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm going to need to be there. Because I, I don't know what he's going to find in that particular toilet. It's not a toilet, the toilet at home. So I'm running after him, and I can see him. And he gets to the hut, but he doesn't know where the door is. So he's like, he's like doing that. He's like, really... <laughs> I don't know what the movement does, but maybe it helps. And uh, anyway, I say, run around the hut, run around, the door's there, the door's there, go, go, go. And he runs in the hut, slams the door, kind of. And, but I look underneath the, the things, and I don't see his feet where they should be. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Like, I know this is not good news. So I think, and, and there's quite a few people around, so I'm trying to really play it cool as well. Don't want anybody to know our problems. And so I go in. And I close the door, and he's at, the, he's at the basin where people brush their teeth and wash their face. And he's cleaning his pants. So, so and I, no problems, eh? This guy's not stressed. Don't feel sorry for him. I'm stressed. In fact, he's, I, he's actually doing an incredible job under the circumstances. He's just taking the Lux soap, the Lux hand soap, and he's cleaning his pants. So anyway, but not getting very far, so I obviously have to jump in. And because of the situation, I'd rather people don't know about this than do know. So I push him out the way, get on the toilet, and, uh, and I start to scrub these pants without the necessary tools to do it. And I clean, the, I clean his pants, and, and he, we, we put them on and we go. And I'm wounded and scarred from the experience. But my son is fine. He's absolutely fine. My point is... If you don't go to camp prepared, you're going to experience some accidents that you don't know are coming, but they're going to come, and they're going to affect you. (laughs) When we travel, when we are sent, we need to have some expectation of what to expect along the way, because if we don't go prepared, we are going to find ourselves in situations, and, and they're not laughable. They are obstructive, and they are Ending of the process. Amen. So I want to just read you this passage of Scripture. I'm going to take you through a few points, and then we're going to wrap up, and you're going to thank me for it. So I'm going to read Luke 10, 6 verses verse from verse 1. It says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. doesn't even sound Christian, does it? But it is. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Point one. It's amazing to set out on a journey or an assignment being told that you're going to be successful right from the beginning. Don't you think that's an encouragement? As I'm sending you out, I know you've never done it before, but I want to tell you this. There's so much money out there. Everyone's going to have enough. Okay, I'll go. But Jesus is kind of saying that here. He says, the harvest is plentiful. The the harvest will never, ever be the problem in our lives. It's never going to be the problem. There's never going to be not enough people to help. There's never, ever going to be no one who needs to hear your story at work. Never. You'll never have that problem. There's always going to be enough people for you to minister to. There's always going to be more than enough. How much plentiful? It means it's unending. It means we could have a church on every corner of Pantan and the harvest will still be plentiful. Because there's enough souls to fill every church that exists today. Amen? You're going to be successful. So what's the problem? The problem is the laborers, the goers. Who's going? That's the problem. Is that I think in a secularized culture, what happens is we live for God, but somehow we feel that we can do that here. Not sure. I'm not sure that that's possible. I'm not sure that that was ever the plan. And I think God is so patient that he's fine if you need a way. We need a way to our. Uh, you know, I, I believe that everybody's in process and making progress. We are so quick to point fingers at the church. But I just, wherever we're at, we're progressing. We might just be at this point today. But we're progressing. And he's patient in our process. But the point is, 
The harvest is not the problem. It's plentiful. I, I, I think if you really set out this week, you could bring five people back next week. I really think that that's what the word says. Is you're not going to have a numbers problem if you go out there. You're not. You might encounter some problems, but I'll prepare you for this. But you're not going to have a numbers problem if you put it in your heart to bring people, reach people for God. Amen. You see, if the harvest is really plentiful, I think our vision really needs to be bigger than our current circumstances. Don't you think? Our current context, always trusting God for beyond what we see with our eyes. Because there is always more to reach. There are always more people to help. There are always more people to serve. There's always a greater community beyond our community. So something has to happen in our hearts that we are able to actually extend our vision even to say, God, we don't just want to reach Pantan or the area that I live in. I want to be influential beyond that. And we know that we're sent to go beyond our immediate area. Second point that I want to speak about is what to expect. Some of the realities of ministry. Jesus says this. In fact, what I think is, let me just touch on that. He says, so, so pray for laborers to go out. I think in our prayer, when we start to pray, we're being prepared for our future. So he starts, he says, pray for laborers that they go out. And then he, what does he do? He sends those same people who are praying. Because that's the breakdown. I think prayer for the harvest and prayer over our lives that we would actually have what it, we need to go out is the start to reaching the world. If we can't pray about it, we'll never think it important enough to actually take a step and go out there. And I'm going to be very gentle today, so I'm going to leave that at that. But then he says, what to expect? He says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. I don't know if you've, let's just stop and think about that for a moment. Have you ever seen in a pen the lambs and the wolves playing together? I said at Living Rivers, if it's ever happened, it only lasted three seconds. (laughs) Because what wolves do is they eat lambs. Yet Jesus says, I'm sending you like lambs, innocent, free, pure, among wolves. The only way that is ever going to work out right is if you have a shepherd who's skillful enough to lead you through a pack of wolves. And you do. And it's Jesus. But there has to be an openness in our own lives, in our own walk, that I am the shepherd is near. Now, he's promised he will always be near. But, you know, if we're, if we're not aware of his presence, if we're not hungry for his presence, or if we're not inviting of his presence, then I'm not sure that we're just going to always feel like he's near. Amen? He's always here. Don't we know that? He is always present. And yet a lot of our lives, we, we, we walk around feeling separated from God. But he's sending us, like, we're going to go there needs to be something in us that cultivates the presence of God, that even in my going, I would experience some of the manifest presence of God, the supernatural divine acts of God as I begin to minister on His behalf. But something has to happen first, that in my own personal life, there has to be a cultivation of God's presence, that we'll never escape the need for Him shepherding us. Amen. It's a dangerous thing to just get gung-ho and say, I'm going for the Lord. He said, I don't think it's sustainable, I don't think it's healthy, and I don't think it's very safe to just go out and expose myself to wolves without the presence of God, knowing that I hear His voice, knowing that He will guide me, whatever I walk through. Amen. So, some of the realities, like lambs among wolves. He goes on to say, how to travel. I want to read you the scripture, it's this verse, it's in verse 4. It says, do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. That's quite interesting. A purse. Now he's speaking in relation to going out and reaching uh, the world around us. Don't take a purse. What does that mean? Except that if you're waiting to have enough, if you're waiting to be secure, having enough security before you go, you're never, ever going to go. If you're worried about how much money you have, if you're worried about if your circumstances are perfect, if you're worried for, if you're waiting for something to happen in your life, for the deal to go through, for the house to sell, for the wife to come, for, for whatever it is you want, it's never going to happen. God is not sending us out in security. He's sending us out knowing He is our security. 
He is your source. When I'm convinced by that, the fruit of my life is that I'm going to go and not wait for perfection before I go. It's never going to happen. You know what somebody said this week? I'm not sure who it was, but it's a, I think it was Tim Keller. God wants to bless you. He does want to bless you. But are you going to see more of the blessing of God on the way than you're going to see while you're waiting for blessing before you go? Because we want to be a people of blessing, but something in us has to invest in Him first before we cry out for the investment of God to be seen in evidence in our own lives. We can't, you know, His love is unconditional. Our service can't be conditional. Is that I'm going to go on the condition that as you, 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 know, you do whatever it is on my heart that I'm trusting you to do. No, I love Him and I'm going to go, but I'm going to go right. So no, don't take a purse. Don't take a bag. Oh, this is real to me because I've just been camping. I've just been to, to New York. I think that, that camping trip would have been so much easier if I didn't have to put up that heavy tent. It's just, it would have been streamlined. The bag weighs enough. Forget about putting it up. But anyway, I watched Cheryl for as long as my conscience would allow me to walk with her heavy bag. It's not the way to travel. <laughs> We all had turns with Cheryl's bag, and we couldn't understand what is in the bag. Because the bag doesn't look big, but it's so heavy. So I'm not quite sure that it matters what bag you take. But more the baggage that's in your life, when you go, if you go. See, baggage never releases you. Baggage keeps you right where you are makes you very heavy and even unconvinced in your own faith that if you went out there to minister in a broken state, would you actually have an impact on somebody else's life? So we live in the realm of our baggage. What's been done to me, what she said of me, about me, you know, what somebody hurt, the, the hurt that was, that was inflicted those many years ago when it happened. Now, Jesus knows about the hurt, and he doesn't leave the hurt undealt with, but he says, if you're not going to release the hurt, then you're never going to go. And if you try to go with that hurt in your, heart, your, your life, in your heart, you're going to find a wolf, and the hurt's probably going to repeat itself. And so deal with your hurt. And try to explain something. Else. It's just a story if you just have little expectation right now. Going on this trip, before we went on this trip, I felt very busy. Like very busy, not, I don't think unnecessarily busy, but very busy, which obviously has its effects. So every day you wake up thinking, right, I've got it together. My mind is clear, my mind is straight, so I know what God's asking us to do. But I don't really have it together, but I have to at least tell myself I've got it together. And we're moving in this direction, let's go, boom. And it's all godly and it's all good, but it's having an impact on my life. And not great impact, but it's, it's unsettling me. And, and the busier I am, the more insecure I'm feeling, just in general. So we're on this trip, and we are surrounded by leaders. But one of the, the, the scariest, I'm trying to be appropriate, one of the scariest observations in this trip was how insecure the leaders are. And you see that in conversation, as much of our conversations around the church. It's what's happening there and what's happening there. And did you hear that? And did you know this? And did you know that that is an unfruitful church. And I'm not, and I'm not making any judgments at all. But it highlighted to me something. As you've got to stay out of that world. The politics of this world. The politics of, of, of church life. The politics of relationships. Stay out of things that seem important but cannot bear a fruit. <laughs> Stay out. Travel light. If you get sucked in, you're going to get heavy and you're not going to move anywhere. And so I came out of that th thanking God for that experience because I came out of it saying again, thank you that I can actually retract and be a child again. That I'm not here to impress men. I'm not here to be part of a grouping or a circle or, 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 or a bunch of leaders. And, and, and thank God, such amazing relationships built over this time. But I'm speaking about my life. Got back to my study this morning at four o'clock. Wasn't four. The alarm went off at four. It was more like 20 to five. But, and, and as the reset, God, I thank you I'm in this place again. I'm alone. And I know that sounds strange because I'm not alone. 
But before God, I'm alone, and I realize the clearest picture of myself is the safest picture of myself, and it's just me. I'm just a son. Nothing more important. You know, we, we get caught up in drama, and because we have drama in our lives and it's intensified, we feel like it's important. And if it's important, we feel like we're important. And I'm telling you, that's a little bit of a deception. If I've got a drama going on and I can't let it go and I really need to deal with this, I don't know. I would just release the people, forgive the people, and move on. It's the quickest way to travel. It's the quickest way to move. It's the most fruitful place to stay. But if I stay in a place where I'm dealing with my baggage and I've got a name and I've got a history and I know its place and I pray about it, I'm so godly, I pray about it every single day. So I'm telling you, you just stay in that place and you'll be praying about that forever until you release it. Until you release it. As I'm astounded how we battle with internal issues, issues with people, issues in relationship. Because I do not want to get caught up in, in getting in the drama with men. Never. I want to read you this psalm very quickly before I move on. It's Psalm 131. It's David's psalm. He was the king of Israel, probably the most influential man in the world at, at his time. And he writes this, Psalm 131 verse 1. It's down there somewhere, but I'll keep reading. There we go. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Now, here's some context. Leave that up. Is He's the king of Israel. The most powerful military force on the earth at that time. Yet he knew to walk into his future, his life could not stay complicated. It had to become simple. So the start of his simplicity was this. I am not proud. I'm not haughty. You know what I think he was saying? Is I'm not important. I might be the king and I might have all this, but... One thing I've realized is what's healthy for me is to have a clear view of myself. And I'm declaring out of my mouth before the Lord today, I am not important. I think he's speaking out of a place of maybe once thinking he was and realizing the freedom of actually coming back to a a real picture of himself is how free I feel when I realize I am not important. And you know what's happened when I've released the value or the importance of my life? Is like a weaned child, I've quietened myself. I am calm within. I have no drama. Now, I don't know if you've ever witnessed a breastfeeding mother. Some of our cultures are differently. It's different. Some of us hide that. Some of us don't. But, But I've watched my boys, when they are thirsty, breastfeeding babies, is that they, they want only one thing and they do not stop until they get it. It's such a good point, this. Is when we're caught up in the insecurities of life and having to be important and, and managing the drama and wanting everyone to know the hurt and, and, and also God. Did you see that, God? Yeah, I saw that. Like 100%. Did, did you see this? <laughs> Did you see the cross? Did you see Jesus first? Anyway, but back to my boys is when they're looking for milk before they weaned, they're not stopping at anything. They will stop a church meeting to get some milk from their mother. And the way they do that is they just scream and the head goes, you know, (laughs) now that's a calm version. There's actually some breathing that goes with that, like breathing. I didn't know you could breathe out your ears, but when a, bo- when a young child is looking for milk, it breathes out of everything until it finds it. It's panic. I need it. I need it. <laughs> panic, 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 panic. Ah. Oh. So, so when the boys weaned, the calm he had on the breast... He now has without it, as he's actually settled. He's quiet. He's calmed. 
There's nothing externally that moves me. It's I'm not going to get caught up in the politics, the things that hinder, or the sin that so easily entangles. I thought it was just a situation. I thought I was hurt. Now I realize I'm hurting people. I'm not going to get caught up. I'm going to release. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to travel a lot. Jesus said, if you're going to go camping or out there, Make sure you pack right. And packing right is packing light. And if you don't go out light, you're going to get caught up and eaten by a wolf. And your wolf experience, listen to this church, is probably going to be the same experience that you had before you went. Anyone heard of a pattern? And we go out there and we get hurt and we get disappointed. You know, gross disappointment, that means I've stopped doing things for God, only means that I hadn't dealt with the hurt that was already there. My expectations of people were far too great to the point that when they didn't meet them, the disappointment stopped me in my tracks. And so we say people hurt us, but you know, people should have no hold on you. And I'm not saying we don't get hurt by people, but I am saying we are called to deal with hurt one way. It's forgive it and release it and move on. How long do you want to stay at a campsite without a toilet? (laughs) Because that's what it's like. It's like, I feel this pain, but I can't relieve it. How long do you want to stay there? Is is this fine? You know, that's the patience of God. I'll just say you're in progress. You're going to get there, but only once you release that. You let it go. And he's patient patient to wait. What he doesn't want is for you to go and suffer the same again in the name of God. Amen. Travel out. He also says, don't greet anyone. Isn't that strange? Don't greet anybody on the way. So the traditional, the customary greeting in the day was to, you don't just say, hey, how's it? I'm on my way. Check you later. That's Durban, South Africa. The Germans have told us that South Africans are rude because when we say, hi, how are you? We actually are just saying, yeah, don't answer. Don't answer, I'm busy. <laughs> but, but customary at the time was to actually stop, stand, have a conversation, engage, and investigate. How are you really? Now, Jesus' point was, the need is urgent. You know, there was a woman in this conference. She was a Syrian. Is that right? So, so obviously, what was raw in her heart was the issue of the Syrian refugees. And just speaking about how... Actually, God has used the refugee crisis in Europe to open up people's hearts to question question Islam. For the first time, you got millions saying, if he's real, why are we here? So point is, they're ready. They are ripe, waiting for somebody to minister to them. But she's saying, unless we go, that particular harvest is dying off. So Jesus is saying... The harvest is a matter of urgency. It's once you determine to go, you need to go. If you stop to talk, you're going to get caught up in a conversation that's going to cost somebody their lives. Now, we don't stop talking, but there has to be an urgency in our lives. This is God's heart. Not for this generation, for every generation. That the harvest today, there's people today that if they don't hear the message, they're going to die. Um, That is heavy, but that is the truth as well. So he... He makes the point is don't greet anybody on the way. Let's make sure I don't have any other amazing points. If I think about trying to move around with baggage, I think the greatest baggages in my life have been issues of my past. I don't know if you've ever encountered the same. Jesus, in just the chapter before it, I think it's the last verse before Luke 10. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. See, if you're trying to plow up the ground and and prepare the way for God or for the Spirit of God to move, but you're transfixed on the past, what happened in the past is you're actually not fit for the job. Now, here's the deal. When Jesus speaks like this, I'm not saying, I don't think he's discrediting your life. You're disqualified. You don't have what what it takes. He's not saying that. He's saying, 
it's not possible to do both. It's not possible to press on while you're holding on. It is not possible. Paul says the same. He says, not that I've reached these things, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. It's so important that I let go of the past because otherwise I will never know the future that he has for me. Anybody want to know the future? Amen, I do. I don't know if you've heard the story of letting go. Letting go of the past, of the story of Lot's wife. Who knows the story? It's a very short story. Jesus said, and, and delivering them from Sodom or allowing them to escape, he said, don't, one thing, not Jesus, the angel, one thing, don't look back. So what did she do? She looked back. Who's ever looked back? I've looked back. I, I've, I've spent six months at a time looking back. I, and I didn't know I was looking back, but I realized after that was done to me, I d- stopped growing. I had an experience in Bible college. A leader shared something with me about somebody else that I cared deeply for, deeply for. Any, anyway, it's a joke. And um, I was offended that this person said those things. Didn't realize I was offended. I thought I managed it well. I was unemotional in hearing the news. But I I realized that I didn't grow. I stopped at that point. And six months later, I said, God, I can't remember feeling free and alive in worship for a long time. I can't remember a new revelation for a long time. And I realized that it was since that time, since that conversation where I took offense and a few words that were said wasn't worth anything, that I stopped growing. You see, they say about Lot's wife, there's many reasons, there's many ideas as as to why she turned into a pill of salt. But it's often that she was so fond of the past. She was fond of the culture that she had become accustomed to that it was actually, she was grieved to leave Sodom. There was something in it that fed something in her. Now, sometimes in our baggage, even though it's negative, it's something in it that makes us feel important. I've got something to fight for. I've got something to hold on for. It's actually my identity because it draws attention to myself. It it wins sympathy because such and such has been done to me. That's fine. If you want to win the sympathy of people because of what's done to you, that is fine. But let me tell you now, you're as good as a pillar. You won't move. And, and, and we'll, even know the, we'll even know the issue. We'll even know the time. We'll know the words. We'll know the, the hurt. We'll know when it was said, how it was done, where, what year it was, you know, 19 something. But we've held on to the hurt so hard that we've actually not moved from that place. We've heard so many good messages. We've read so much Bible. But still here, heavy, weighed down, lots of baggage. It's not how you called to live. Amen. Fourth point out of five, five minutes to go, smile. He says this in verse five. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, then your peace will stay with them. But if they don't, it'll come back to you. This is what I love about this scripture. If you've got personal issues, you don't take rejection well. I'm not asking. I think that's the reality. Is If I've got internal emotional hurts and issues, is that when somebody rejects me, I feel it. Jesus is making the point is I've called you to be a man of peace. So when you enter into a house, you say, peace be to this house. But if they reject you, It doesn't affect you. The peace comes back to you. But you can only be that man of peace if you don't have baggage, if you're not living in the hurts of the past or the hurts of a relationship. You're called to be that. I love that. Why? Because it means that externally nobody can hurt me. Amen? Not a word, not a rejection, not a criticism. It cannot move me. Why? Because I've found my peace in the shepherd. Not in the ones that he's called me to reach. Imagine me going out to minister to the lost. Yet when the lost reject me, the one who came to help them is now moved and, uh, you know, unsettled. Imagine that. No logic in that. He's called, he sent you out solid. 
You've found peace in me. The, the likelihood of rejection is high. It's very, very high. So Kim Keller says, you know, in this world, we're, we're not even fighting that. So he, he said this, post-Christian culture. It used to be that, yes, I know that's the truth, but I'm not ready for the truth. Now it is the fact that you say you know the truth offends me because there isn't a truth in the world. That's what we're fighting with. The fact that you say you have salvation offends me. The fact that I'm free from your salvation is my salvation. That's the world that we're dealing with. Is they don't want to be told what to do, that there's one way for any man, that every way is free, and I want to be free to experience anything I want. That's the world that we're dealing with. The point is, when we go out, rejection is most definitely going to be part of our journey. But the joy is I've found peace in Christ, and so I'm unmoved by the rejection of men. Now, here's the deal, church, is that we suffer the rejection of our loved ones, and we struggle. Ones that we trust know and ultimately know their hearts. That doesn't speak of one who is sent, but Jesus is patience. And he says, you're in progress or in process. And so let's deal with what's in our hearts today. Amen. I love that. At the end of the passage, the, the disciples went and they came back. And I'm going to find the verse. And in verse 21, they come back and they say to Jesus, you won't believe it. I think Jesus said at this point, I will. I think I will. He says, even the demons submitted to us under your name. And he said like, duh. <laughs> I know that's old. So 1990 slash 80. But it's coming back. But yeah, I was in heaven when Satan was was thrown down to hell, and it didn't happen slowly. He didn't float down. He, he wasn't lowered down. Are you still okay, devil? Just tell me when your feet hit the ground, and I'll let the rope go. Jesus says, he hit the ground like a bolt of lightning, bang, by my authority. Authority is not the issue. So they were surprised, as will we be how submitted demons are under his name. So Jesus, as in response to their, their, um, their claims, which were true, looks up to heaven and the Bible says, full of the joy of the Spirit of God, he says, Father, you have done this because it pleased you. That you didn't reveal these things to the wise or the learned, but you revealed them to those who are like little children. Innocent, pure, and ready to serve God, trusting. Now the joy of this for me in my life is that I never have to earn, I never have to qualify myself to begin to minister on behalf of God. Never, church. You don't, I don't have to wait to get to a place. I don't have to wait to get to a level of, of knowledge before I can start to speak into somebody's life. I'm not intimidated by those who seem learned. I'm not intimidated by those who seem wise in the, in the world's eyes. It's, it's, it seems like apparently Jesus actually reveals authority and power to those who would approach him like children. But I'm telling you, those twisted with drama and hurt and wounds and other things, somehow in that we lose our innocence. It's because we're holding men to account. So and so did this and justice needs to come. And when it does, I'm going to be right. And then I'm going to go because I'm vindicated. And everyone will love me because they will know that she was wrong and I was right. And now I have power and authority to speak. And I know that's just for fun. But often we'll reason our stay. We'll reason our lack of moving. Whatever it is, right now I've got three kids, I've got four kids. Yeah, yeah. However many you got, I'll raise you one. <laughs> I'm just, I could stay here, but I'm going to move on. We will reason why wow, I can't. I'm scared. I, I was scared. Very, I'm still scared, actually. But realizing that in fear, if I'm going to accept fear, then I need to just accept to stay. Not to win one. I'm not hugely self-confident. But I have to find confidence somewhere. 
So I choose to find it in him. There's evidence in my life that doesn't look great. You know, sometimes, sometimes, not, not sometimes. I have need. I have emotional need. I have relational need. I have financial need. But I have a provider. I have source. I have healing available. I have time. I have trust. I have relationship with Jesus. So I'm able to find those in him. See, the deal is my peace only comes, not, not because I'm circumstantially free, because I'm not, but because I have one who will always be committed to setting me free, regardless of the circumstances. I'm never going to give them a place of prominence in my life. I'm always going to make sure that they are smaller than he is. Otherwise, I'm going to get caught up in the politics of my life, and it's going to slow me down. There's a scripture so I just want to wrap up that point. And he hasn't called you to be somebody but you. He's not called you to be somebody except you. That you're enough. More than enough. And the same authority that shot the devil down to hell has been offered to you if you would go in his name. If you would just get clean, be obedient, release. Forgive, get over it, walk away, walk on, move away. There's this passage of scripture at the end of that uh, I read to you out of Judges 6, and I read to verse 11, but verse 12, in fact, verse 12 says this, 11, I'll read from verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, I think it's called, that belonged to Joash the Abizarat, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Gideon was living in fear. They usually you thresh wheat in an open, I think the threshing floor, it's a wide open space, everybody sees it. But Gideon was in the wine press, surviving, trying to put together some food in the midst of oppression, so that they could live. And the angel of the Lord appeared to get in and he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So I want to say this to you. I don't think that the Lord would say anything less to you this morning in your wine press. Whatever it is that's holding you back, it's a wine press. It's a place where hard. We give reasons and the reasons are our walls the injustice the hurt nobody knows my story the debt the size of the debt all these things that we have that stop us they're your wine press what i love about god and how he sees you and how he sees me is he'll never say hey simon in the wine press yes you the guy hiding in the wine press no he says the lord is with you mighty warrior so he speaks to me as the one who he's called me to be, not the one I'm currently showing I am. So I don't think he would say anything less, but Gideon had to get out to do something. He had to kick down that wine press. He had to remove it from his life. So I want to say to you this morning, if we're going to move on, if we're going to be like those who were sent that could come back and say, Jesus, you, well, I know you know it, but I need to tell you, even the demons submit to us, me, in your name. If we're going to be like them, like children, we have to recognize the wine press, what's holding me back, and then we have to obliterate it. We have to be prepared to say, I'm not going to let this thing Rob me of another day in God. Because it's not stealing your natural life. It's stealing your godly life. It's stealing your purpose. It's stealing the power of God working through you today. Because we're scared. It's how, whatever it is, however scary it is, there is one who is greater church. And I know that these are cliches that sometimes we, we hide behind, but it's not a cliche. So let's stand.
I have great expectation, excitement to imagine us coming back to say, you know what, you won't believe what happened this week. The harvest is in fact plentiful. I have evidence. So there's not one visitor in this church today. That's just the way it happened this week. But I want to say that the harvest is plentiful. But we have to come out. We have to get out. We are not going to be the secular side portion of the church. We're not going to be that we're blending in with society. Nobody would ever know. We're going to be noticed. We're going to be influential. We're going to be present with his presence. Amen. But some, we have to release something first. We have to get out. We have to kick down whatever it is that has shut us up. Amen. If you're going to kick down a wine press today, if you're going to get out, jump out, climb out, whatever it is you want to do, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand just so I know that I'm praying with somebody because I'm going to do that. And I'm going to trust God to release me in peace. I'm leaving the baggage here at the altar and I'm walking out free. Isn't that awesome for you today? I am walking out free. I'm not going to give it another word. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to argue its presence in my life. I'm leaving it here. Father, I thank you that we are, we are praying. We are endeavoring. Our hearts right now are so much in line with your will. You promise us, God, that at the throne we find mercy and grace for our particular need. And so right now, as we bring these heavy weights before you, I thank you, God, that we can put them down at the altar. In fact, it's what the altar's made of. And we're asking that you would burn them up as we repent for holding on. We repent for hiding in fear. We repent for hiding in our own woundedness. And we say we're letting go. Not another day lost in our lives. So right now, I'm gonna ask you just to release Forgive, repent, whatever it is. But letting go means letting go. And God, our declaration this morning is we press on to take hold of that for which you have taken hold of us. In Jesus' name, we thank you that this place will be full of life and joy, and healing, and wholeness, and peace. God, I thank you that we are free from the rejection of men, and so free to suffer the rejection of men, because you have accepted us in every way. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for a new anointing on our lives, to go out, to speak, to speak freely, to be bringers of peace, to be bringers of healing, to be bringers of truth. I thank you for an authority on our lives that is unstoppable. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, church.